Thank you, Phil. My two takeaways were sort of, is your B2B marketing like Angry Birds? Um, that's going to that's gonna stick with me. Um, but the primary one is, should 20% of investment um, be sufficient when it actually represents about 50% of the overall sort of economic value? As the path to purchase becomes increasingly complex, B2B marketers are realizing that leads are humans too and in many ways need to rediscover the art of branding. So what can we learn from, what, from B2C and what do we still have to figure out? The next session I'm delighted to introduce is a fireside chat moderated by Charlotte McKelleny, the digital editor of marketing, Dean Aragon, the VP of brand and CEO of Shell Brands International, Chris Perry, the CEO of Wonderman UK, and Penry Price, VP of Global Marketing Solutions at LinkedIn. Maybe it's worth saying which of us is which. I'm obviously Charlotte. <laughs> <That's the> obvious. <laughs> <laughs> I'm obviously Dean. <laughs> Chris. Right. Um, so maybe a good place to start is to, to go straight in. Do we think that uh, consumer brands tend to be more creative, more human than, than B2B brands? Is that a fair thing to say? I don't think it's fair to say, but I think that there are things in consumer brands marketing that now having transferred to a company like Shell where there is a lot of B2B marketing that can be truly le leveraged. Uh, for instance, the whole notion of humanizing a brand. Um, because the B2B customer, no matter how technical the subject, you know, at the end of the day is still a human being mm -hmm. and inescapably looks at things, receives and perceives, if you like, through the human lens. And um, uh, that, that entails um, leveraging both the left and the right brain. And I think sometimes we get too mired in the whole technical aspects, forgetting that there, is, there are other factors at play. Mm. So I think that's one thing that consumer brand marketeers tend to also dwell into because there are psychological levers at play that you need to fully understand. Chris, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I think the, the consumer marketing side of things is actually coming towards the, the, the B2B side of things. So in a, a world where you have you know, most of your media, particularly in digital, being programmatic in some way or partnership based, mm -hmm. then you know, the granular understanding of what your audiences want, what they're doing at that specific point in time, and actually the ability to target those, those hotspots uh, with interesting, relevant, meaningful messages in consumer marketing is, is what you know, B2B has been doing for a very, very long time, albeit with less technology. And so I think you know, the, the B2C learning around how to create that content, how to actually do that, you know, if you think, for instance, that you know, Twitter's going to last about three hours, uh, Facebook's going to last about kind of three days, and, and YouTube's going to last about uh, you know, 30, 30 hours. You know, you kind of get to a place where you've got to be able to kind of do that stuff quickly. And again, I think B2B has been kind of quite responsive to those granular audiences, whereas, you know, B2C is coming actually to a place where it's, it's learning how to do that with newsrooms, learning how to do that with kind of granular, granular content and atomic experiences, which are, are kind of meaningful and, and resonant for, for the audiences. Yeah, I, I agree with these. I think the other sort of sentiment I would say would be uh, there's definitely learnings from B2C, and I think as Dean says, there's, a, there's emotion in the consumer who's also a professional that has to be addressed, and I think there's more, more tools out today than ever before about understanding sentiment and understanding how people perceive the brand. I would say, though, that the, the one difference that will always be different is B2B actually knows who their audience is. Mm and they have to make sure that they are specifically talking and addressing that audience. Now using more emotion and more ways to connect to, to both sides of the brain I think uh, is now again exactly what people are starting to do and take advantage of but there always will be that difference with B2C you know we're talking to any consumer maybe some sort of general targeting demographically but we're talking to try to have anybody buy my product where again with B2B, we have a very specific audience we're trying to speak to, mm -hmm. and we're trying to build a very different relationship 
versus a transactional, generally a transactional relationship with a B2C opportunity. Whereas again, I think from a B2B standpoint, it is many times a much longer sales cycle. And so there's a relationship that needs to be built. And I think we've done that maybe a little more sort of antiseptically or very focused on sort of thinking about it from a B2B mindset. And now we're seeing it start to build that relationship over with emotion and other ways to actually start to build uh, a, a new trust in that brand and understanding what that brand stands for. Yeah. So you've actually got an interesting thing where we've come to the point where B2B could learn from B2C as well, and sort of the flip side. And what do you think has sort of created that, that situation? Is it sort of digital, social? And, you know, why are we talking about this now? And what, what's the co sort of context of making this sort of an interesting Point. You know, the, the ability to create kind of resident, res, resonant, meaningful messages for audiences and making them relevant is, is still exactly the same. Mm -hmm. I just think the techniques have changed. I think the techniques are, are different these days. And I think this whole idea around, you know, data-driven creativity. So actually, you know, the same thing, you know, in, in a B2B uh, example we have for a, a client of ours, Microsoft. You know, one of the things they were looking to do was really empower the small business audience. And, and you know, the, the kind of insights you're looking for is 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 kind of things outside the organisation that you need to bring in. Because when you think small business, you think, okay, this is a sector of, of of the audience. But actually, you know, small businesses consider themselves to be the biggest in their area or the best in their. You know, it's it's one of those things where it it kind of still requires that insight external to the organization to bring it in. So it's exactly the same, it's just the techniques are faster, they're more content driven, and they're more data driven. I also think the B2B customers are far <coughs> more connected uh, than we think. And sometimes I, I'm astonished as to how we compartmentalize the, 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 the people at the other end of the table as though they were 24 seven that persona. Yeah. And denying the reality that they are Yes, uh, perhaps uh, in, in a business deal or at, at, uh, at, at, at the cusp of a, business, of a business deal, but they are much, much more than that. And they are living the lives of you know, a parent, a sibling, a community member, you know, as connected in, in the digital uh, uh, platforms. And there is a lot more appetite for learning other things. And um, being, coming from a very consumer-orientated business like Unilever, I was surprised as, as to how sometimes uh, the B2B transactions, which I thought to be much more centered on the technical aspects, sometimes they start with you know, um, he, the human offer. Mm. So there's the technical offer, the product offer, the service offer. But sometimes we're surprised, actually, it begins with the human offer, such as values, um, authenticity, as you mentioned, um, a, a passion for the business, a sense of a sense of winning. Um, and, and these are things that sometimes, for a lot of our product technical uh, people, they're not necessarily prepared to engage. Because it, it also requires a sense of revelation mm. uh, and, and opening up. And, and that can be uncomfortable. So what things are you sort of telling your, your marketing team at, at Shell that you've sort of brought on from your time at Unilever? What, what are some of the, the tips that you're bringing in? Insight mining. Um, as in genuine insights, not <coughs> insights that are really observations. Mm -hmm. um, because sometimes we, we abuse the word insights, but you know, what I learned was that insights were ans the real answers once you've peeled away mm -hmm. a lot of the layers. And you know, asking the question why at least five times. Mm -hmm. um, because often the rich stimuli that then you can use to evoke a specific response from a potential business partner lies in the response to those insights. And they're not necessarily just the technical aspects or the technical insights. So I, I would call them human insights. Mm. Okay. What about you? You're at the agency, you have sort of both B2B and B2C clients. Do people tend to work across both, or do you have people who are sort of specific? How does that, that work? It, it, tends to be, it tends to be client focused, but I think, again, some of the, the, the techniques and the departmental approaches apply. And I think, you know, the point about insights is a really good one. You know, the rich insights are, are very, very difficult to find. So, you know, the ability to search for those things, um, you know, to observe 
as a start point for that, you know, um, some of the things that you can, again, because we're a, a data-driven agency, some of the things you see really just in terms of the patterns of humanity are really, really interesting. You know, Sunday night, people are trying to lose weight. Monday morning, people are thinking about dentures. Mm. Uh, Wednesday, thinking, people are thinking about snoring. Not in that order. Yeah, well, no, th this is just my week. Yeah. But, you know, and, and Thursday night, there's a lot of people on, on mobile phones thinking about headaches. You know, you kind of see these things and you see the patterns and actually then using those and taking them to the next level and making them insights is very much the start of, of you know, the, the briefing process, which then becomes the creative execution and, and the evolution of that. So, so to your point, we are working in B2B and B2C teams, but, you know, the, the way of working is, is exactly the same across both of those. I think that part of this is, to me, exactly what these guys are saying. We, as partners to them, uh, both of them, it puts, um, you know, sort of more pressure, frankly, on, on us as a partner to deliver these insights yeah. and to really mine our own platform, in our case LinkedIn, to figure out what is, what's the intelligence that I can bring to these guys that helps them with their business objectives. Uh, this is... I think that the world has changed dramatically, as you're saying, like what has forced this to happen? What is sort of, what has been the change? The, bit, the change clearly is, the, is being connected, is the web, is definitely the change. And I think that will only continue. You know, clearly there's more disruption to happen and more things. But if, if partners can actually really think about the business objectives of who they are supporting mm. um, and, and figure out what is unique about your platform to drive intelligence that is where you become a valuable partner. And so I think it puts, again, more pressure on uh, the media partners uh, of, the, of the clients, but that's what the game is, and that's what's changed. It is not a buy-sell relationship any longer. It is clearly a you know, intelligence gathering, data mining, insights understanding relationship, and that is where you know, these relationships, to me, have changed dramatically over this, and it's all because of being connected. Yeah. So who's doing it well? What brands have you seen that are sort of, uh, you know, doing the exact things that you're just saying? Yeah, I think part of it is, and we were talking a little bit before, but part of it is the realization that, um, you know, brands have to be human. Brands have to have an emotion. And when they let themselves go a little bit, have a little vul vulnerability, they start to create much more interesting content, much more interesting ways for their consumers, whether they be more broadly based or, again, a very specific B2B targeted mm -hmm. base. Um, you know, just thinking about uh, Air France, who has done a pretty interesting new video-based campaign where it's very little, it's, again, more B2C, but they're also talking to the, you know, sort of business traveler and sort of the new sort of upgraded sort of Air France experience. And I think they're doing it in a more B2C-like way, but to me, they're talking directly to the B2B sort of long travel, you know, sort of business traveler. And so that's one just, just literally that's live today, that's running, that I think is more, again, of blending what we're talking about, sort of this human understanding and emotional connection to the actual video creative, but telling a story that is respond, or that it should be responding or hitting the business traveler in a much different way than in the past. Yeah, that's it. You got any examples of sort of brands you think are doing? Yeah, well? I'd, I'd go back to Microsoft again. I think, you know, just in terms of this, this balancing the two things, and you said it kind of the right brain, the left brain, mm. you know, one of the things I wanted to do was empower the IT manager within organizations and spend a lot of time, you know, um, IT managers are often maligned and, and, you know, kind of there's a perception of them. But actually, you know, they are quite often the individuals within organizations most able to understand the new world on behalf of, of that organization. So empowering them with information and, you know, that understanding and that insight and then giving them multiple types of content and shortening and adapting the way that they actually uh, get that content in terms of actually profiling and, and, and working with them and, and, and really having a kind of uh, a CRM type strategy but, but without knowing them personally. Mm -hmm. Those sort of techniques and then on top of that having, as you say, the video techniques and, and the white paper techniques and all the things we know in terms of um, B2B that are, that are working, you know, work very well but actually need to be adapted and evolved and optimised. It's those two kind of two sides of the brain that I think um, that are, are most important to actually doing it well in my view. I'm a GE groupie. I like GE as well. Uh, I love GE. I, I, mean, I, I, yeah. I, think, I think they have come to terms with the power of creativity, even on a very 
technical aspect. So I, I love, for instance, uh, how many of you have seen the video ideas are scary? Mm -hmm. I think that's phenomenal. And clearly it's, it, it is publicly broadcast that you can see it, but you can YouTube it, but it's, 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 it's clearly talking to potential business partners that this is an organization that will channel the spirit of Thomas Edison. You know? mm -hmm. uh, I love the way they, they position themselves as the, the world's oldest startup. And, and I think uh, their ability to just open up, you know. So sometimes where I think B2B businesses um, <coughs> need to open up more is on, you know, it doesn't have to be a very, very cold subject. Mm. It ca you have to employ the same uh, demands on creativity, the, the same demands on stimulating a response mm. that you would have on a consumer brand. They've obviously spent a lot of effort in the production and the craft of those ads, haven't they? I think that's sort of... That's what sort of sets them out a little bit. Yes, and um, no, and 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 I, and I think they have, I think they have, in, empowered their agencies and their partners to really go for it. Because sometimes we get surprised by the work we receive when eighty percent of the ads or the products or the the outcomes have already been predetermined in the briefs. Mm. So what do you actually expect agencies to deliver, or partners to deliver if? More, most of it is already predetermined with you know, mandatory elements. What about some of the other sort of human aspects? We were talking sort of backstage a little bit about sort of CSR and the sort of purpose of brands and things. And how does that play into this um, you know, from in a B2B <coughs> market? How much does, does the sort of um, purpose of a brand have to sort of come out in, in, in some of this? I think, I think that's where I come in with you know, my pitch for the power of brands. And whether your business as an established brand, a nascent brand, or a yet-to-be-articulated brand, uh, you do things in a certain way. You know, so let's take the case of a brand that is even be beyond before nascent. It's just emerging. The, the fact of the matter is that you are channeling a way of doing things. And that becomes the brand. And the, the, the key there is to um, how does that practice survive the current protagonist or proponents? How do you bottle that so that it's something that's consistently coming from your organization, whether it's only three people or five? Mm. And then within that, a brand becomes human when it has a sense of direction and purpose. But sometimes also it gets confused with, this is not a sense of purpose beyond the pursuit of profit, because that will be growing a conscience. This is how you profit from a sense of purpose, because then that becomes a repeatable model. You know, it, and this is the nature of capitalism. You need to make sure that it rewards the business. Uh, doing good means you, re you will really do well. And, and I think that then becomes that virtuous cycle of businesses that deliver a sense of purpose that then incites a shared value, shared principles. And you connect. And the irony is in B2B, unlike B2C, as you mentioned, there is a greater potential to develop, establish, nurture, enduring relationships which is very difficult in the B2C market because it's you know, shotgun versus sniper specific. Yeah. You know, I think there's a really interesting dynamic in terms of some of the speed and transitory <coughs> nature of some new brands. So you know, Farmville was an $80 million business for about six months and then is no more really in terms of actually it, 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 its preeminence. And I think you know, to your point about brands, you know, that consistent, reliable understanding and that um, way of doing things that's manifest in everything you do is actually the way to defend yourself against that sort of transitory nature. And, and again, in a very connected world, it's even more important to do that. And so I think it's, a, it's that sort of way of thinking about things in B2B and B2C that, that's absolutely vital. Um, otherwise, you know, there's a, there's, there are dangers. Yeah, I think <coughs> that's the... Sorry. Um, that's the thing, again, that's changed, is this notion of a transparent relationship also, which is now this digital social media platforms where I as a consumer or I as a business partner to the B2B, I have a, an avenue now that is open at all times to speak to not only directly to that customer or that partner of mine or company, but also all of my networks, all of my friends, their friends, their connections, my professionals from a LinkedIn standpoint. You know, that changes the dynamic very quickly about how authentic a brand has to behave in terms of how do I, as a brand, want my 
you know, sort of brand to be positioned in that sort of open and transparent environment. And if you're not authentic, you know, you might as well just close up shop. I mean, I think people see it very, very quickly in this, in this new environment. And so to me, this part of the CSR relationship is around authenticity and trust. And trust is, you know, we sort of talk it as sort of it's a, a, a relationship, an equation of consistency over time. And I think that's the notion of what these platforms have given you is a chance to be actually very authentic and not as much in an altruistic way. Mm -hmm. It's still about profit, still about growing, but you can do it in a very authentic way, which helps mm -hmm. continue to uh, reinforce what the brand stands for in a very open and, again, transparent way that we just didn't have as marketers mm -hmm. 10 years ago or five years ago, even really, at scale. And that has changed, I think, the, the whole way that we all have to deal with the market. Do you think brands are adapting to this, this yeah. fast enough? Yeah, I think so. I, I don't, fast enough, I think, would be uh, a hard one because I think each brand is going to be different at different pace and, and the way they use uh, social media or general digital is going to be different. Um, and so it's hard to judge that each of them can move at the same pace. But I do think that they're adapting. I do see, there's, a, there's again, wonderful examples of whether it be uh, things on Twitter that you hear somebody replies. So, you know, I was flying recently and I was, like all of us, a business traveler, but also a really upset customer mm -hmm. um, that it was, I felt the service was terrible and et cetera. So I went on Twitter and I got a quick response and changed my perception of actually how they had handled the situation only because that response happened in somewhat real time. And that is, to me, a way that a brand is really productively using social media. You hear all, so all sorts of examples on the other side, which is inauthentic, you know, not responsive, and it lets all of a sudden the swirl go and go, and it gets much worse than the one person that might have been you know, sort of angry at that time. So I think, yes, it's happening. I think it's moving quickly, but it's still, each business is going to be different about how they utilize these and if tools. And sort of comparing consumer and B2B, do you think B2B brands have been slower to adopt that kind of social media um, sort of customer service sort of angle on it compared to some of the consumer sort of Yeah, I, th I think a little bit slower probably is the right general uh, view on things. I think part of it is that you know, there's been sort of LinkedIn and Facebook will use around the same age. Mm. Facebook obviously grew uh, because of it being much more about social and friends, where this is, you know, LinkedIn is more about professionals and investing time. Um, and so I think people understand the differences in these two worlds. But from a business standpoint, I'm just starting to get to understand how I use LinkedIn differently than I use, than I use Facebook or than I use Twitter. <laughs> And so um, I think B2B, again, is because of the long relationship, and I think because of what has already been said, the web generally was not really built for long relationships. And the early <coughs> days of the web was much more search and transact versus how do I learn and how do I really grow my relationship with some information on the web. I think that's changing very, very rapidly now, and you're starting to see B2B embrace the web because I think the web is offering more to B2B than we have in the past. Do you get many people going on LinkedIn and sort of complaining about an IT system they've bought or something? Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's less of this, again, I think Twitter is used more for that real-time response, mm. but I see we have groups where there's places where people will, you know, there's sort of forums around uh, interests or mm. forums around audiences or forums around companies. And you know, you'll see very interesting, heated debates, and you'll see lots of opinions, and you'll see, again, I think early days you might see companies jumping in with a, like a phantom name and trying to respond and sort of sell their own services through that relationship. Yeah. And that has been called out as being very, again, inauthentic, not a great way to do it. And that's been now a best practice where people are very forthcoming and say, hey, I am from company X, and I really want to make sure that you understand what we're trying to do here. And, and building that relationship. So I think that happens on LinkedIn as well. Uh, it's just a little bit more about, um, it's not as much of a quick, I'm angry. It's more of, I want to learn, ha help me out. This is a community of professionals that I trust and I, I know are going to look at this the same perspective that I'm going to look. You know, help me understand what's happening here. The, uh, the thing we've seen over the last couple of years of, uh, as large businesses have kind of figured out the ability to identify how to do social media so much better because mm. there is a thin line between 
bold and crazy, you know, in, in these me media mm -hmm. and actually mm -hmm. operationalizing that so that you're not responding to events that are totally inappropriate, that you're not actually in places where you shouldn't be and that, you know, the quite often it's given to uh, a more junior member of staff and so actually they, they need to be supported in terms of actually the things they can and can't do. And actually they want to be bold, they want to actually be meaningful, otherwise no one will listen, which is you know, not as bad but, but nearly as bad. And so actually I think over the last couple of years we've seen that, that work much better and I think it's, it's beginning to, to really gel as a, as a way of working. Yeah. I mean, at Shell you must find yourself with that problem sort of every day, sort of which conversations do we enter and which are just sort of you know, not worth entering, how do you? Yeah, I mean, I mean social media is a space, you know, we're a big, we're, we're quite successful in LinkedIn, and um, but I think because social media was not invented for mm. brands and businesses, it was invented for human beings, and it's actually as old as human civilization, except that it's enabled by technology, we tend to forget that it's about them, not us. Mm. And, <coughs> and we often, I think fall into the trap of interrupting human connection on what interests us as humans, you know, what sharing our passion points, and we interrupt that. Um, I, I often kid that it's about, you know, having two girlfriends talk about what, you know, I don't know, something that they're fascinated about, and, and here's a business that says, hello girls, would you like to see my tanker? <laughs> and, 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 you know, that is both <laughs> creepy and perverted at many levels. Uh, but so many businesses do that, you know, like, yeah. can I show you what I need to show you? And it's going, hello, uh, who are you? Uh, why are you interrupting my conversation? Who let you in? <laughs> and, and that's the common mistake. So the one thing I would always recommend is, you know, it's about them, not us. And the real creativity is how do you celebrate what they are passionate about and find an organic, elegant way of weaving in your narrative into theirs. Because otherwise you are, you are forcing yourself into uh, a space to which you are uninvited. Mm, absolutely. Um, what have we got left? We've got enough time for a couple of questions. There we go anyway. Um, um, so what would, you, what would be your sort of top tip then from a sort of consumer brand to a, to a B2B brand? What would be your sort of top learning? That you would be conscious about the fact that yes, indeed, they need to buy something from you, but you must equally be conscious about what they are buying into. And that's where the brand comes, comes in. And that's where the humanity and the emotional aspects of the right brain comes in. So it's a combination of buying and buying into. It's not one or the other, but it's how you calibrate or balance the two factors. Because your customers in a B2B transaction, despite how they look and how they behave, are still very human. And as such, are inescapably going to receive and perceive through the human lens. Um, I would add to that by saying, I think, you know, figuring out how to use the vast amount of data in these channels mm -hmm. to be more creative but f being centered on, as you say, the humanity of that, uh, you know, the meaningfulness and, and the purpose of that and the brand and doing that as fast uh, and as responsive and adaptively as possible would be the, the way to figure this for the future. Uh, I think <coughs> after 10 plus years of social media, I would say that we now should understand that these, uh, because they're all sort of networks, um, it doesn't mean they're the same at all. Um, we should make sure that we're thinking of the large networks as sort of each individual entities in terms of what's the message that should be at w on one of them, what's the message that should be on, again, for LinkedIn, what's the right content, because I think for a lot of these, what we're finding out is context is incredibly important. That's part of what Dean is saying. You've, why are you here? And so understanding why you are there um, from both your sort of goals as a company, as a for-profit company, as well as the user or the member in our case, why, why am I engaging in this? So I would say making sure that you have very clear strategies that are for each of the networks that you work in, in the sort of network space, is critical for success today. I think one of the things I've, I've noticed in other sessions as well as, as this is this sort of the theme that You've got to be creative and then understand data, and you've got to sort of be executional, but then sort of <laughs> understand the sort of overall strength. How do you hire for that? How do you sort of build a brand or a team around that kind of thing? And what sort of 
skills do we need to enable this to happen? I, I think you need the balance of both um, because for marketing for the most part is both chemistry and alchemy and um, because the human mind is a fickle mind and um, but there are hard truths there are hard data you, you cannot just be afford to be anecdotal so you need someone who also is capable of the rigor of anal analysis mining data but at the same time you need that same individual to translate that into creative highly stimulating ideas and executions because that's when the rubber hits the road and and and, and so it cannot be one or the other. It, and, and so you're al always looking for the optimum balance of both. Uh, I think there's two parts of that. I think there is a uh, admission uh, that is most people don't uh, get interested in data. It's not the data. You know, it's actually the people and the observations in the data. And most people actually, when, you, when the rubber hits the road, aren't empirical you know you look at it and you go that's numbers I really don't want to do numbers. you know and so actually providing people to to join that together with the creative people with the the people that are, that are kind of thinking about the, the wider context is is the first thing to do I think there is also a generational thing coming through in terms of the the next generation of producers of content uh, you know uh, the the 18 year olds today think about this stuff very differently uh, as we do in terms of both publishing and, and thinking about the channels. So I think that will help. But I think it's that join in the middle and figuring that out. And there's also uh, lots of ways to do that. Yeah. Um, I'll talk less about hiring, more about uh, retaining. I think you know, a lot of us end up talking about hi how do you hire, but you don't spend as n enough time. I think all of us have large organizations that we have more employees today than we're going to hire in the next year or two years, et cetera. So, to me, a big focus has to be, from an enterprise perspective, is how do you re retain employees? You know, how do you treat them like the unicorns that they are? They're in these roles because they've demonstrated some capacity to really help the organization. So to me, a lot about talent is around retaining them <coughs> and making sure they feel empowered to be a part of this, uh, you know, sort of changing world and, and making sure they have the tools to be as successful as possible is where to, to us as an organization we spend a lot of time. And it's hard to hire, I'm not sort of giving up on that, but I, but I think for us we think a lot on retention and making sure we're empowering people and challenging them uh, so they can be enthusiastic about what they do every day. I guess part of that goes back to that culture and brand that you're sort of building earlier, if it's something that people that actually, you know, not just customers, but if you work for a brand you believe in, that sort of helps power that as well. You can't give what you don't have. So if you, if, you, if you cultivate that in the team, in the way you do things, then you increase the chances of channeling that and manifesting that to customers, whether in a B2C, B2B, B2G, or B2I transaction. Because um, you can't game it. You, you can't game these things. And, um, and that's the bit also about the humanity in a B2B transaction. Y you tend to sort of put on the game face, the game mode, but but that's really just a facade because the reality is your authenticity needs to shine through and in the way you present yourself and the, the merits of the technical aspects of the deal or the offer and they all need to hang together so that they are genuinely um, clear to the customer at the receiving end, you know, what's in it for me? And, and it's not just one or the other, it's, it's, it's really a fusion of both. I don't know how long we've been talking for now. We've exceeded Done. it by an hour. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> They're not complaining. So. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much.